Ready to get started? Um, I am totally delighted to introduce Dr. Kirby Dieterdecker. There's no chance I'll be able to capture all of his accomplishments, but try to give you at least a flavor with selected highlights. Um, Dr. Dieterdecker was an undergraduate at Penn State, where apparently Maureen pointed him in the right direction. <laughs> I have some stories. <laughs> I have some stories. He got his PhD at the University of Virginia. Um, he's now at Virginia Tech, where he's a professor in psychology and also the director of their developmental science program. Um, by any metric, Dr. Dieter Decker is a rock star. Um, <laughs> in addition to numerous true. chapters and books, he has published 120 peer reviewed journal articles, 31 in the last three years alone. And to say that these are in the field's top journals would be an understatement. He has seven articles in child development, and his work is uniformly in the very best outlets in the field. He has $8 million in grants currently, <laughs> um, with major awards from NIMH, NICHD, NSF, and NIDA, and that's just currently. He has many more millions. Um, he has built and is building important bridges across areas that badly need connecting, um, making himself relevant to every corner of our department. And that's not just rhetoric. I challenge you to look at his vita uh, and not find something that's relevant to what you're doing, um, which is a statement given the breadth, given the breadth in this room. Um, I started citing him early in my career because he had done seminal work um, in understanding parenting and discipline in the context of culture and changing the way that the field looked at that and bringing empirical rigor to an area that very sorely needed it. Um, it turns out he was just barely getting warmed up because he has since done equally simil seminal and influential work in various areas of developmental psychology, including in advanced statistical and measurement techniques, to which I say yay. <laughs> um, broadly speaking, he looks at the causes and consequences of individual differences in children's cognitive and social emotional attributes, he examines biological and contextual factors and self-regulation and adaptation to contribute to a wide range of risk and resilience and outcome factors. And he has several research lines going, uh, any one of which would be impressive in its own right. Three examples are his work on the development of self-regulation, his work on parenting across cultures, and his work with the Learning Transformation Group with Virginia Tech colleagues in computer science and mathematics. His work spans cognition, emotion, behavior, psychopathology, health risk behaviors, and educational outcomes. Um, and he integrates physiological, genetic, behavioral, and now neuroimaging indicators. Um, the breadth and depth of his work are both incredibly impressive. Recently, he's done groundbreaking work on the intergenerational transmission of attention and executive function. Um, and self-regulation more broadly, which we'll get to hear about today. Um, mm -hmm. I've just read his in-press like, bulletin article on this topic, uh, and it's definitely yet another field changer. So the field of developmental science is indebted to him, and we're very fortunate to have him with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirby. Mm -hmm. That was really kind, and, and I feel like I shouldn't talk now. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, the title of my talk is Family Matters and the Development of Self-Regulation. And the reason I have this title for this talk is that I want to emphasize um, that when, when thinking about self-regulation and, and our collaborative work on the variability in self-regulation, individual differences in self-regulation, uh, family matters loom large uh, for two reasons. We must think about intergenerational transmission. And families, of course, for the vast majority of us, are the source of both genetic and non-genetic information that feeds into that system, that produces offspring that become the next generation of parents. And it's also the case, and this is a big puzzle perhaps, but uh, for me it kind of makes sense that this would be the case. Almost all, of, almost all, much of the variability in the types of things we study uh, in the self-regulation realm and 
more broadly than that even, in psychology and behavior, um, most of that variability is within family lines. It's within each and every family line. And in fact, the variability that you see in the population is a reflection of that. It doesn't work the other way around. Um, uh, families are differentiators. And the variability is vast enough that it raises important questions about our current and recent theories about gene environment processes. So I'm going to say a bit about that in my presentation today. I want to start off just with a general, couple general points about self-regulation. This is a very broad construct. It's an old construct, an old idea. And I want to try just talking a little bit about the issues you know, on which um, particular psychology that you're in, uh, think about self-regulation in a particular way. The approach I use is very much rooted in differential psychology and individual differences in population genetics and neurobiology, thinking about these interacting systems at different levels of the organism that are there to maintain homeostasis in the face of lots of changes that can occur within the body and inside of the body. And th just thinking about the modulation of physiological, cognitive, affective, behavioral uh, features of the individual, of the organism, through these changing environments. When we're highly habitual in our behavior, so that our environments actually don't change that much, <laughs> systems are still geared to fluctuate. So we see a lot of within individual variation. We see plenty of variation. There are interesting developmental questions about this, and that's what we're really trying to better understand. Self-regulation is critical to learning and having uh, know that it's a lot of attention over the decades because of this. It, it keeps coming up um, depending on how you measure it and operationalize it as a really important feature of physical health and mental health in many domains. It involves many physical and psychological constructs that are transmitted and developed via gene environment processes in context. And I have this little cartoon with bathroom people to make a couple points. The first is that it's all contextualized, and I'll show you some examples of this. This is old news, but I hope with some of the examples I'll give you, it'll make it perhaps more interesting and salient for you as an important point. Self-regulation generationally this is lifelong social relationship. A colleague of mine in gerontology, Karen Roberto, and I were submitting an NIA, National Institute of Aging grant, next week to look at some of the very same things we're going to talk about today with respect to adult caregivers of their very old parents. Thinking about how intergenerational transmission of self-regulation at that end of the lifespan is operating in terms of the types of um, that we're seeing. Um, I want to say a bit more about what these constructs are. There are many to choose from. I emphasize these top-down um, constructs in the self-regulation field. Um, but the and others to choose from. And I'll say more about that at the beginning of the presentation. When did they develop, both in terms of ontogeny and individual differences? How do these uh, self regulated constructs develop? We look specifically at gene environment interaction and focusing on intergenerational questions. And so we're, in the last decade, we've been focusing a lot on parental self regulation and how these self regulation processes operate in the parent in terms of affecting the types of parenting behavior that produce the environments for their young children that are tuning up their self-regulation systems. This is something we actually don't know much about with regard to self-regulation system specifically. And then where next? If time allows, I'll say more about current and future research. And an idea I have for a center um, that might get traction here, I don't know. If there's time, I'll throw it out there. And, and if you guys get excited, we'll go look for bags of money. There's going to be some around here somewhere. Um, so what are the constructs? Um, David mentioned this psych bulletin paper. David Bridget at Northern Illinois University uh, is an assistant professor there. And he and I got to talking about a need for such a, a comprehensive review that pulled together various literature. A lot of it's in the literature. Um, a lot of it is in um, neurophysiology and psychophysiology literature. And lately, the last two decades, a lot of it's been parked in the developmental psychopathology literature. So this was a big challenge for him and his students and me to pull this together, but it was fun and we, we succeeded in the end. Um, so I want to just give you a snapshot of some of the conclusions we came to with regard to 
these constructs. The mainstreams that we saw in the literature over the last 75, 80 years or so were in, with regard to physiological reactivity, the approach avoidance distinction, Jeffrey Gray's theory being the most cited, but not the only, and emotional reactivity. He's seen as these bottom-up types of regulation. In evolutionary terms, the older systems that involve um, reactions to changes in the environment that aren't sustainable. They just, you can't keep doing that. So these bottom-up regulatory features have built into them a fatiguing process that on its own regulates um, the, your ability to sustain, um, for instance, a super high heart rate. <laughs> and eventually that, that has to change. That's just one example. Um, through evolution, we've developed um, these more cortically uh, based, top-down, much more effortful um, components of self-regulation, also in the same domains, physiological, executive function, effortful control, and emotion regulation, getting at things like vagal tone or uh, heart variability, inhibitory, attentional and activation control, cognitive reappraisal and suppression. And for those of you that do self-regulation work, this is, I mean, there are other ways to, completely other ways to think about self-regulation. Um, just as one example, Tori Higgins' goal theory-based approach um, to self-regulatory focus and these sorts of things is just one example that's not represented well here. This is really meant to represent more the emerging consensus with regard to where the individual differences in intergenerational transmission literatures are going. Okay. So what are the outcomes? There's ample evidence, and here I'm just limiting it to research on um, kids and teens for the most part with regard to better learning outcomes, better social emotional regulation and functioning, less psychopathology and aggression, and um, better physical health. And so um, what we've known for a long time with regard to adults has been developmentally brought back to even research with infants and toddlers showing that early indicators of good self-regulation appear to be associated early on with the variance in these better developmental outcomes. I, I don't have time to talk about it today, but I would make the argument um, based on some data that those systems of the connections between the variance in these outcomes and the variance in these self-regulatory indicators get set into place very early in development. And although you see ontogeny going in all kinds of different directions, the connections between these um, self-regulation components and these outcomes are, get set into place pretty early in development. So that raises lots of interesting questions, I think, in terms of that's the case and what, do, what does that mean in terms of translation? How do you go in and perturb that system when you want to do that? Some ideas about theories, lots of theorists to choose from. I won't name one, to, I'll get in trouble, but um, I just want to talk about this general idea. You can think about this at the physiological level, at the behavioral, cognitive level, that you have these stressors, demands, challenges coming in and the individual has to respond to that. And this is meant mostly as a metaphor, but this notion that the individual must wait then go to give, give yourself some time and not just react. Consider relevant information. Disregard irrelevant information. Generate potential responses. Enact and evaluate responses. Um, neuromodulation of the reactive response in a more sort of cognitive neuroscience way of speaking. And the idea here is that the system is allowing um, time. And typically it's fast and almost always it's outside of conscious awareness. But it's, the system is allowing time. And a really good self-regulator can still respond pretty quickly, but they're still in fairly rapid time doing a lot more than a poor self-regulator in terms of what's going on with uh, modulating behavioral, emotional, affective, cognitive response. So when do these top-down constructs develop? So I'll first just show you some typical data for, uh, with regard to ontogeny from um, here at the bottom, it's a little hard to see, age and years from 0 to 15 uh, for um, high frequency heart rate variability for digit span raw scores. This is combined forward, backward. Uh, for scores on the effort effortful and inhibitory control scales of Mary Rothbart's temperament questionnaire. And depending on the, on the construct that you're looking at in the measure, you might see most of the growth 
happening down early in development and a flattening out, or you might see linear growth. Some have argued that this is kind of baked into the assessment method um, with regard to the, the spans uh, tasks. But this is very typical. We see this um, species typical in improvements in performance over childhood into adolescence. And then there's lots of interesting things happening in, middle age, in adulthood and middle age that we just don't have time to talk about right now, but um, that's part of the story too, especially when you're studying parents, middle-aged parents, many of whom are being dysregulated by their children, and they're also being dysregulated by their parents. So this sort of sandwich generation experience. In terms of stabilization of individual differences, um, here are just some examples of data from many studies. This is, uh, these are data points with regard to um, age differences. Some of it's longitudinal data, mostly cross-sectional, from five to 20 years of age in heritability estimates for inattention or attention measures, for RSA, HRV, or vagal tone, for inhibitory control, for working memory performance. And then this is the function from Kathy McCartney's seminal meta-analysis um, published in Psych Bulletin in 1990, I think, for IQ, just to show you um, what, what that meta-analysis showed for IQ. So we can see this upward shift developmentally in the stability coefficients. Basically, the, you can think of these as test-retest stability coefficients for these various types of performance and questionnaire measures of self-regulation. So how do these individual differences develop? So in this uh, paper that David Bridget and I and his students worked on, um, we thought a lot about this and we tried to pull together some uh, traditionally disparate literatures with regard to thinking about what's going on in here in the middle and what's going on with respect to intergenerational transmission. Um, so I'm going to first focus on these pre and postnatal gene environment interaction ideas, give a couple of examples of that work, and then talk about the parent self-regulation work that we've been doing more, uh, more fervently recently as in the second part of the, uh, the data presentation that I'll do. So I have three examples. I like three. I don't know why. I just always do that. Um, looking at stressor, stressors, gene environment interaction, and self-regulation. The first example looks at working memory and effortful control at six to eight years of age, looking at pre and perinatal risks, a distressed prenatal environment. So looking at the effects of birth weight and premature birth on subsequent working memory and effortful control at six to eight years of age. And I also like to tell you the result before I present it, because then I remember to tell you the results. <laughs> So here we're seeing evidence. This is hot off the press, so don't cite it yet, but um, we're working on the paper to submit now um, of genome-specific, possibly sign of an epigenetic um, gene environment interaction effect in the greatest, that's greatest in high-stress environments where you're looking at the low birth weight babies that are also born prematurely. So I'll show you an example there. A second example of on executive function and impulse control at four and a half years the postnatal risk being extensive non-parental care, looking at age of onset in hours per week. This is a controversial stressor. I know that. Believe me, we looked for quality of care effects. It, it did not matter in this model. It was t when it started and how many hours a week um, that emerged as the stressor in this gene environment risk analysis, looking at the dopamine receptor 4 gene 7 repeat allele, and looking at its effects being enhanced in the highest stress environments. And the third example, with regard to attentive behavior and attention problems from 6 to 11 years of age, the postnatal risk being low levels of maternal sensitivity in early childhood, showing a similar interaction effect there, where it's in the highest stress environment where you see the evidence of this um, candidate gene risk factor for attention problems. A really quick um, overview. Uh, here's a nice little NIH-sponsored cartoon of, the, of you know, of of the brain, sort of, <laughs> and showing the dopamine and serotonin pathways and the frontal cortex. And um, the candidate gene work that my colleagues and I have focused on have been mostly in these monomine neuromodulators that work in the prefrontal and frontal cortices, uh, specifically dopamine, but also norep and serotonin being degraded by MAOA and MAOB. 
DEAOB. So this is why so much of the candidate gene work has focused on dopamine, serotonin, MAOA, MAOB, COMT as well. Um, the neurogenetics of executive function, for instance, is a good example where we've got a lot of research now in humans, um, in addition to all of the cell um, work and animal work, showing pretty clear signs that dopamine receptor 4, along with other candidate genes, being associated with individual differences in sustained attention and response inhibition. And this is the location of dopamine receptor 4. There's this very well understood, in terms of its location, very well understood VNTR, this 48 pair repeat sequence, 2 to 11 repeats, with the 7 repeat allele um, relatively low in frequency being associated with lower dopamine uh, DRD4 expression in frontal cortex. So that's why we've been focusing a lot on the DRD4 48 base pair repeat. I want to first present this pre and perinatal risk, um, these pre and perinatal risk findings. One of the cool things about studying identical twins is it's a nice natural experiment with many caveats, of course, uh, for looking at sources of differentiation. So here we can study identical twin differences in birth weight. We can't study identical twin differences in gestation, right, because they generally come out at the same time. Um, but we can study identical twin differences in birth weight. And the, um, the obstetrics folks are getting better and better at um, measuring differences in placenta structure, chorion structure, and these sorts of things. Super important. I mean, the more we learn about what's going on in terms of epigenetic modifications prenatally, the more we're realizing that we need to better understand these structures uh, within the womb because they're doing a lot of work of filtering out or filtering out um, the effects of stressors on the mother. So we can study these identical twin differences in birth weight and look later, in this case we're looking at six to eight years later, identical twin differences in working memory and effortful control. And this kind of a connection, if we see one, may well be a signal of some kind of epigenetic modifications that are happening differentially um, to two structurally identical genomes. So this is the general idea. And what we're finding, we're seeing this for the is that as you look backwards in terms of gestational age at birth, um, the, the more premature you are, the bigger the association between identical twin difference in birth weight and identical twin difference in both working memory and effortful control. So it's this combination of being born early and being born small that when compared to your structural DNA clone, that's where you're seeing the biggest effect in terms of a difference in birth weight being associated with the difference in, um, in these case, these two indicators of self-regulation. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? This really surprised us, but I, we wouldn't have even done this analysis five years ago. We wouldn't have even thought to look for it. But the, the thinking about what's going on um, prenatally, even in, simply in terms of twin differentiation, months to try and better understand what might be going on there. Second example, looking at executive function and impulse, impulse control at four and a half years, looking at this postnatal risk of, of extensive non, non-parental care. And these are effect sizes again, simple slopes um, showing the association between extent of non-parental care and um, stroop task performance, delay of gratification, and inattention impulsivity. Um, showing this effect, this association between um, exposure to this non-parental care in the first five years, uh, first four years of life and the, the presence of this seven repeat allele um, and no such effect for those without the seven repeat allele. So this is a more classic gene environment interaction, candidate gene environment interaction uh, finding published in Developmental Psychobiology by Dan Barry who's now at um, University of Illinois. This third example, looking at um, low levels of maternal sensitivity observed in the home at age three, looking at it interacting with the dopamine receptor four candidate gene, predicting attentive behavior and attention problems from four to 11 years of age. Uh, this is using teacher reported outcomes from four to 11 years of age. And these are longitudinal data. Also Dan Barry's work. <coughs> 
And here when you see the presence of the seven repeat allele in an environment with low levels of maternal sensitivity, this is the trajectory you see for attention problems. And the presence of the allele with high maternal sensitivity, this is the trajectory you see for attention problems. Um, Dan is a fan of the, diff of the plasticity gene concept. Some of you have seen this, and so it's not all bad news in his view because the, the kids who have the risk allele and yet are receiving warm, supportive environments are showing the lowest levels of attention problems, although statistically it didn't work out. So he and I argued a lot about that. <laughs> and it shows up as a tiny little maybe in this paper, but um, it's a pretty exciting idea. So the genetic risk, again, being enhanced in the highest stress environment. So when we think about the, uh, the parenting environment as a stressor or a, a resiliency, a source of resilience, and especially within an intergenerational transmission context, we want to think about what might be going on with regard to parental sensitivity and caregiving and parental self-regulation. So this has been a big part of what we've been looking at lately. I would argue it's essential. We know, we know way too little about um, how it is that, that caregivers as self-regulators um, manage to do it. <laughs> um, the, I wrote a book in 2004 on parenting stress and I was really struck when I summarized that literature at how we had sort of had demonized parents and had anglicized, uh, angels, angel-sized um, babies and for those of you who've been around babies you know that they're, they're rough. <laughs> um, you know and, and one way to think about it is it's this, this chronic perturber of your environment and <laughs> And it doesn't go away. I have an 18-year-old. Um, so <laughs> depends on the 18-year-old, right? But, but anyway, really th uh, wanting to speak to this now a little bit in terms of thinking about this piece of the intergenerational transmission process and really trying to get a better sense and understanding of what parents are doing and what they are like as self-regulators and how it affects their caregiving. So Aunt Allie Crandall, who's now a postdoc at Emory, uh, she did her PhD at Johns Hopkins University with Ann Riley, and I had the fortune of serving as an external member of her committee. And she was really interested in, in um, developing some ideas about parental cog uh, emotional cognitive control. And so the literature review and theoretical piece of her dissertation has just been accepted developmental review. So go Allie, it's awesome. Um, and it's uh, summarized well here. So here we've got a mom, and the question mark is meant to remind us that what's she going to do? I mean, you've got grumpy Gus here presenting challenging emotions and behaviors. And I want to just point to one consistent finding in the, the child psychology literature. When you look at the parents of kids with ADHD, ODD, OCD, or not OCD, um, chronic disorder, etc., the, the variance that you see in the parenting in that population of families is the same or greater, the variance, than what you see in the population of non-disordered kids. So there are lots of parents doing a fabulous job, we would say in a judgmental way, a fabulous job with really tough kids. So what are they doing? How do they do it? Well, they're doing a lot. Um, so we're trying to better understand what it is that differentiates parents um, when in the face of challenging child behavior. Do they react with strong and chronic negativity? And in extreme cases, we worry a lot in terms of child abuse risk. Well, self-regulation obviously matters a lot here. And we're really curious about how these different aspects and systems of self-regulation can come in and cut this path off to allow a parent, even in the toughest of times, at least most of the times, to be able to offer a somewhat well-regulated response in the face of some pretty challenging child behavior. And I don't want to paint this picture as a psychopathology model. This is, this is a parenting kids intergenerational transmission model. This is the normal process of, of socializing kids and uh, we suspect, Karen Roberto and I, taking care of your aging parents too. Um, it's the, part of the caregiving process. So we've done a few studies looking at executive function, showing that it's a really important modulator. Um, I'll show you the detailed findings here in a minute, because there's time for that. And most recently, um, looking at parental emotion regulation and physiological regulation, looking at things like vagal tone and cognitive reappraisal and midfrontal um, alpha asymmetry, 
uh, from EEG recordings showing that these appear to be telling us a lot too about what it is that differentiate, appears to differentiate uh, moms who are looking reactive as opposed to non-reactive in their parenting behavior in the face of challenges. We've also been looking at some contextual stressors, chronic socioeconomic and parenting stressors. So I'll say a bit more about that in a few minutes. These stressors can be things like um, stress, <laughs> sorry, yeah, fatigue, uncertainty, and distractions. The current study we're doing, funded by NIMH, is looking very specifically at um, psychological, psychosocial stressors and fatigue. We're looking at sleep problems in the moms and, the, and young kids and seeing how this might feed into some difficult issues with self-regulation in both the moms and the young children. And we think this matters because this may come in and in a system that otherwise would be operating pretty well in terms of regulating can come in and just shut it down. And I don't, I don't have a better metaphor for it at this moment, but um, perhaps it comes in and overwhelms that regulatory process or just subsumes it in some way so that we can't see it when we look for it in these highly stressed, chronically stressed environments. So these are some details from the studies, the mom regulation study, the work twin study, and the N2CAP adoption study. And the interesting thing about these two studies is that we used a sibling difference quasi-experiment. So here we um, look twin and non-twin siblings, adopted siblings in fact, and we observed the mom 20 to 30 minutes apart doing these semi-structured tasks. And then we asked the question, um, where do we see the correlation between um, the mom's negativity toward this kid versus this kid and the obnoxious behavior of this kid versus this kid? So we're looking at the within family association between sibling difference in obnoxious behavior and sibling difference in maternal negativity directed toward that child, 30 minutes apart. We do visits, turn on the camera, get semi-structured tasks to do. And this was just a more standard one child, one mom, lab-based observation. And what we're finding is, a, is what we're calling a maternal regulatory effect, where for the mothers with either um, high levels of working memory, in the case of these studies, or an executive function composite score, um, in the case of this study, we're seeing an attenuation of this association. It's not that these moms aren't showing negative affect. They are. It's just not correlating with the kids of not. So we're seeing some kind of evidence in this quasi-correlational data for, a, for a, a breaking apart of that effect. When you look at the, the moms with the lowest um, levels on these self-regulation constructs, we're seeing associations approaching 0.6. This is a little more messy, and I apologize for that, but here we see evidence for this uh, maternal regulatory effect again, and looking in low chaos households, or households with low number of socioeconomic and parenting stressors, 